Good morning. This is the 13th of November, 2020. And we're privileged today to have another hour of the time <laughs> of our pastor, Greg Allen Pickett, because he's busy on Sunday. This is nice to have you in the, in the middle part between today and well, thanks. Talking about once in future church. Um, I don't know if you guys were thinking of Camelot when, you, when the series title was written, but it sounds like once in future church. Right? What has been when what shall be. And last time, the first in the series, we talked a little bit about the structure and the framework of what is and where we are in terms of numbers. So there is a kind of a, a leaning towards present time, but it gives us a chance to ask about future as well. And how did we get there with tonight's discussion? I'm welcoming our pastors today. Happy to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Very glad. To be Would you like to begin with prayer or end with prayer? I had to ask. Uh, we'll do both. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I'll start. You finish. Does that Please. sound good? Please. This is this is what goes out on their show in the morning. So. <laughs> <laughs> on Monday morning. Dear God, thank you for bringing us together today. The bubble of the coffee and the warmth of the air moving through the room reminds us the time of year. And we are grateful for the change. We're grateful for what we're going to learn today about what has been and what is now and what will probably change in the future. Guide us in understanding and acting on here today, faithfully and in love. Amen. Amen. Um, well, I am honestly delighted to be here. I, I love thinking about these things with uh, other people. Um, and I, did Damon describe, he sent us questions about um, what to think about. And I was going to read the questions, but basically it was really, really broad. And so uh, I was talking with Polly Devin Williams, uh, our executive presbyter who uh, presented last week. And then I, I also talked with Shelley Latham, who will be presenting next week. Shelley Latham is the president of the Omaha Presbyterian Seminary Foundation. She's in a kind of unique position to think about both the history of the church, but also the future of the church. I don't know how many of you know that Omaha, we used to have a Presbyterian seminary in Omaha. And eventually, uh, enrollments dried up enough that they decided to close the seminary, sell the campus, and put the money into an endowment to continue the mission of equipping pastors, which is what a seminary does in theory, um, without a campus, without professors, without being a seminary. Uh, and so that organization has an interesting insight because they are uh, the direct result of a decline in enrollments in seminary, <laughs> the organization as it exists now, and then they're also looking to the future. And so, I'm excited to hear what Shelly has to say next week. Uh, and I'm also excited because she's preaching next week, which gives me a Sunday off, which is wonderful. Um, but it was it, 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 it's a very, very broad topic. And so I'll just share with you all my thought process. I thought, okay, the once in future church. So what are what are we what are we doing with this? And the first thing that I did was think like on a on like a really high scale, let's see, how do I advance my slides? There we go. Um, so what's going on in the religious landscape in the United States? That's That, that was my first thought. And so this is uh, USA religious preference over the last 70 years from Gallup polls. And it starts in 1945 at the end of World War II. And so what you can see is, and this, this is, uh, you can see there are a few other religions down here, Judaism, other religions, and then this black line is the nuns, but the red line is Christians. So Starting in 1945, at the end of World War II, 90% of our country uh, self-identified as Christian. It kind of peaked there in 1955, and as you can see, it has been on a steady decline ever since. Um, there's a little bump up here uh, that, that has not been sustained, if you look at the data. <laughs> uh, and so, okay, so what does that mean for the once and future church? I ask you, what does that mean for the once in future church? Interesting, just an interesting observation. It is interesting to see how, um, you know, 
the nuns do continue to uh, to increase and uh, at at a significant rate compared to Christians. Yes. I mean, they're not going other places; they're going to nuns. Yes. So the black line, as you can see, is none, N O N E, not, not the nun. Not the <laughs> <N-U-N>. <laughs> Which would uh, be fun. If it was N U N, we would have an outbreak of convents all over the United <laughs> States because as this line increases, you got to house the nuns somewhere, right? But that's the different kind of nun. Um, in fact, as a point, religious orders are also on the decline. So convents of Jesuits and monks and all that stuff is, is, is going away. But um, yeah, so. Yeah, they're 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 leaving Christianity. They're not joining other religions. They're joining this group that we call the nuns. Um, sometimes we call them the nuns and duns, people who are done with organized religion, um, and they're often grouped as the, as, as one and the same. Can, <clears throat> do they? What does nun believe exactly? Is it uh, what does nun mean? Does it mean they're atheists or are they the type that call themselves spiritual but not religious? Both. Right, so this is Gallup polling, and so you can dig deeper into the poll and see, okay, what are your actual beliefs? But yeah, the, there's a phrase called spiritual but not religious. It's even got its own acronym, and it's not Presbyterians that turned it into an acronym because we turn everything into acronyms, but SBNR. And so if you're digging into the sociological data about religion, sociologists now call, call this a certain group of nuns the SBNRs, the spiritual but not religious. So they say, I believe in a higher being, I'm a spiritual person, I just don't do organized religion. I don't go to church. I don't profess uh, Orthodox Christian faith or whatever. But so they, the 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 SBNRs, the spiritual but not religious, would be mixed in with also the atheists or the agnostics or whatever. So so this is where my brain went when I was asked, okay, what are the once in future church? Where is this going? Well, y'all do data and trend lines. We can pretty <laughs> easily map a trend line there. Um, uh, as I was doing research for this, one of the things that I read, um, there's all kinds of people who are prognosticating, but uh, there's, there was a big study that came out a few months ago that said by 2050, um, Christians will no longer be a minority or even a plurality. Uh, a study came out about two months ago that said that that 50% mark has actually already been hit in terms of people who profess and claim um, a religious community, but that there's 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 competing data out there. So this is another one of the. Um, so this was this was religious preference over the years. This is specifically church membership among U.S. adults, and then this is that data that I was talking about that it has now fallen below 50% for the first time um, since World War II. That uh, church membership among U.S. adults is now below 50% in the United States. Any reflections on that? Thinking about the once and future church. So 70% claim to be Christian. But only 50% are actually a member of a church. So that 20% is obviously identifying with something that is out there parachurch or outside that they're claiming as christian correct but they do not belong as a member to a religious community membership is a we could do an entire once in the future church on the concept of membership right so since covid we have uh four people in new mexico two people in colorado and five people in iowa who attend our services more than some of our members via facebook who give to the church more than some of our members and who participate in the life of the church by watching things like these and by uh, tuning into Bible studies and that sort of thing. Now, technically, those are not members because PCUSA has a geographic limitation on membership. Um, but do we, do we think of them as members of our church family? I certainly do. These are folks that are deeply engaged with the life of the church. Um, and some of them happen to be family members of mine and Damon's, but then like Joyce, uh, or lives in Benson, Arizona. And Joyce is still very active in the life of this church. Her daughter in Colorado has become active in the life of this church since COVID. Um, we have another person who joined the church, Grant Hunter, his grandparents 
live in New Mexico and their church shut down during COVID. So they started tuning into our worship services and then started tuning into our Bible studies and then started engaging with us. And so now they're still very active, right? So it, that, that we could do a whole thing on membership. We're not going to. <laughs> There's also a thing about generations in membership. And um, Matt, I, you're technically a millennial, right? I'm like right in between. Right. But I'm, I'm, and I'm right in between two on the Gen X side, but mm -hmm. both Gen Xers and millennials tend not to join organizations. Uh, very low trust of institutions and organizations. And so they'll participate in an organization, but they're not interested in joining because membership doesn't mean the same thing. My, my note here is, and this perhaps connects to, uh, to your statement there, uh, you know, you can see since the mid to late 90s, uh, there's been such a significant decrease. Yep. Um, and so, you know, you think from 73 to 70 is a kind of little blip there in the mid to late 90s. But then since then, wow, what a significant decline we've seen. That's a really good course point. Of that. If we mark that point and that point, right, 1995, 70% of people have been members of churches since 1995. Yeah. Wow. Do you think social media is it's definitely got an impact, but is it <clears throat> leaning more to the good or the bad? Uh, it seems like without looking for it, it's in your face all the time if you're right. on net and the zeal that those people show, it's too bad that us Christians don't have that same outright yeah. statements. But yeah. So I got really into these first two slides and started reading a bunch of sociological research and I ran out of time this week because I can dig into this stuff. And I think you all know, I worked at the national church at the PCSA national church headquarters for about four years. And so I was in the swirl of all of this, talking about these larger national trends. And so then here's another interesting slide. These are uh, membership totals for what they call, this, this particular sociologist calls the seven sisters of the mainline. We have a term that we use called mainline Protestant denominations. Um, and so these, this is the American Baptist Church, the United Church of Christ, the Disciples of Christ, the Episcopal Church, the United Methodist Church, ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, and the PCUSA, that's us. Um, and us and the Disciples of Christ have experienced the greatest amount of membership loss in the last 10 years. But everybody's down. Um, and so the... Uh, what do y'all think about that? The Methodists have probably came down a little more since that. Probably, yeah. That's mm -hmm. a 2019 data yeah. point for them. Um, yeah, th this 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 is a sociologist of religion, and uh, he pulled the most recent congregational statistic numbers that he could. So you got 19, 18, 19, 20, that sort of thing. So yeah, all these trend lines are. But this is just interesting. It's it's not just the Presbyterians, though the Presbyterians clearly have been pretty hard hit by this. Um, it's it's a lot of what are called mainline churches. And there was a blip in the early 2000s through 2010 where it looked like uh, non-denominational churches or churches that are not part of the mainline were on a growth pattern. That has since been completely erased and they're all facing these same types of declines because, again, <laughs> right, there may be one or two exceptions out there, but the overall trend is, is that way. And then amongst the main lines, it's uh, so. What do we do with this data? Thinking about the once and a future church. So, some people would look at the one in blue up there, the ABC, uh -huh. and say, well, what's working for them? So the, uh, the sociologist who put together this particular slide said basically that churches underreport and misrepresent oh, their data. Okay. Oh, never mind. <laughs> that was his point. Want to um, look good, Red. Then yeah, that's what they basically. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> if we want to take this down to the micro scale, 
there's an American Baptist church that's uh, two blocks south of here, oh, yeah. and uh, they are dwindling into almost nothing. Mm -hmm. And so, and across the state of Nebraska, the American Baptist church is experiencing significant decline and loss. I have a couple of friends who are American Baptist churches in Nebraska who, who would, who would, they would question the validity of that number as well. I picked up on the fact that you said um, you have some friends in the Baptist church and it leads me to say how, how much have the clergy and communities where there's a recognizable change across, let's say a community like Grand Island, Omaha, pick one, gotten together and said, what is the culture of our community? <coughs> in other words, however we define our city or community and said, is that part of it? Right. What do we do on Sunday? What do we do on Wednesdays? You know, those sorts of things. That's certainly, uh, those are conversations that are being had. Nebraska and the Midwest is not contributing as much to this decline as other parts of the United States right now. Um, and so, and, and we're certainly not experiencing this here locally. But I, I sort of got, like I said, I went down this rabbit hole of looking at these <laughs> national statistics and, and these data points and what's going on and why and i thought we could maybe talk about this for an hour but it's pretty depressing <laughs> not great very honest with you Greg, is the green uh the episcopal church this is the episcopal church i'm just thinking about their the similarity that the, the churches if you throw the the american baptists out as kind of an anomaly right you uh -huh. say they're under report but think of think in terms of liturgy in terms of who's declining and who's not declining as much. You have the UCC and the Disciples of Christ and the PCUSA uh, that are not as high church as, mm -hmm. let's say, you know, the United, you know, United Methodist and the ELCA uh, and uh, the Episcopal Church. I wonder if there's any correlation there. Or, or... Yeah, there's a lot that has been written about worship styles and whether or not that has an impact on church membership. I, I don't put much stock in that anymore. Um, and yeah, where I've landed on worship styles specifically as it relates to worship attendance and membership, um, I, I've come down, for me, the way that I choose to lead on two points. One is authenticity right. and one is excellence. I want us to be doing things well and I want us to be our authentic self. And I think if we do that, whether we are doing a rock concert every Sunday morning or whether we are doing a traditional worship service with organ and choir, is almost irrelevant the style. The question is, are we doing it with authenticity and are we doing it with excellence? And that will, I think authenticity and excellence will attract people, even if it's not the style that they're, they think, you know, but I'm not convinced that worship style has much to do with, um, I don't know, that that was in the, in the late 2000s or in the, in the mid 2000s when you were seeing a boom in evangelical churches and non-denominational churches, that was, everyone was writing, hey, having a rock band, having, you know, bringing yeah. secular style of music into the church, that's it, that's bringing people in. And ultimately what the sociologists determined on that was that the, the front door was wide open on those churches and the back door was wide open too. So people were coming in, and they were leaving, and not staying. So you saw a boom in membership in those churches for a few years, and then you saw a decline in membership in those churches as people left. The question is, where did they go? Did they become nuns and duns, or did they find their way to another place? Here, or a more traditional worship, or whatever. And that's... So, any other... Thoughts, ideas, feedback. I, like I said, this, this, this. If we dwell on this stuff, it can get pretty depressing pretty quickly. And when I worked at the national denominational headquarters, I lived through the middle of this. I worked there from 2012 to 2016. This is 2009 to 2020. You want to guess how much hand wringing was going on in Louisville at this time? Um. And, and a decline in resources, naturally, right? The national denomination is funded by local churches, not the other way around. We don't receive money from the national denomination. We send money to the national denomination. 
Now, if there's a disaster in Nebraska, we will receive money from the national denomination. If we have a particular project, we can get a grant sometimes. But on the whole, we're giving a lot more to the national denomination than we are receiving from the denomination. And, um, and so the national denomination is in decline because there's, there's less Presbyterians than pews. And thinking of the trends, especially the <clears throat> downward trend, aren't most people like sheep? And doesn't this kind of snowball on itself? There's people, probably a self-perpetuating cycle of yeah. this, right? If, 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 if my neighbors stop going to church on Sunday mornings and I don't see them leaving at 9.30, well, next Sunday morning, maybe I won't leave at 9.30. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier to stay in the warm house and have bacon and eggs than it is to get the family dressed and packed up and in the car and right maybe i don't know well There's and you know i comment it all on it all the time that a sunday is so much different than it used to be it's like when we drive through Minden anymore on a sunday you it's usually busier traffic wise than any other day of the week and it never used to be like that. You'd be the only car driving through town on a Sunday afternoon. Well, now everybody's going somewhere. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's not church. <laughs> yeah. So I started going down this rabbit hole as I was preparing. I started getting really disappointed and upset and sad and frustrated. <laughs> I remember why I left Louisville. <laughs> right? um, and so then, then I thought, if all of this is true, What's going on here that's different? What makes this a place that is bucking all of those trends? So we've added 120 plus new members in the five and a half years that I've been here, including we're adding seven more today, which is exciting. We did three baptisms in the last two weeks. Our attendance is actually on a trend line back up, which is wonderful. Our budget is healthy. These are, these are marks. These are tangible metrics that you can tell about a congregational's health. But an intangible metric is this positive spirit. People are engaged and they, they want to be here. They choose to be here. Um, so why is that? What's going on in this place that bucks all of those national trends? And frankly, even bucks a lot of the trends here in Hastings. And I don't I don't want to in any way cast aspersions on other churches in Hastings because other churches are doing remarkable work. But I will tell you, like the UCC church is right on the precipice of deciding whether or not they can still, still afford a full-time pastor. Uh, Jessica Pallas was there and she did wonderful work there and she's left and uh, Barry Remp is filling in as the interim, but they're spending a lot of time figuring out whether they can even call a new pastor. That's the UCC church. Exact same story as the Disciples of Christ church. Exact same story at the ELCA Lutheran Church, Good Shepherd Lutheran across the street from the high school. That's three mainline churches in Hastings that are right on that bubble as to whether or not they're going to be able to continue with a full-time call installed pastor. Um, so, so what is it? What is going on? What's that? Where's the Disciples of Christ Church? It's on 12th Street, the ski slope one. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Visualizing all of them in that yeah, one. That was good. I was coming up blank on that one. Yeah, it's uh, there's a particular architectural style of creating uh -huh. those ski slopes and roofs, mm -hmm. um, and you can find them all over. Oh, really? The United States. Oh, yeah, yeah. Every church or every town has a ski slope church in it <laughs> because there was an architect in the 1950s who was building ski slope churches, and everybody liked it. Hmm. Yep. Well, I mean, or my like guess that. is architecture. The idea is like it moves your eye upward towards God, right? You kind of yeah. fall the slope up, although the slopes to me go down. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why. Maybe that's why. Um, so, so I started thinking about that. Uh, that's that that that's where my brain went, and so then I started thinking about. There's a term that's used by all of these mainline churches called mm -hmm. congregational vitality, and there are consultants out there who will do an assessment of your congregation to help you think about congregational vitality. We have not had one of these consultants out and we have not done one of these assessments in my time here. I don't know if the church did before I got here, but this, so all of these mainline churches that are wringing their hands and worrying about decline 
have all of these resources and consultants out that are teaching classes about congregational vitality, and they, they all have a name. They, 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 they use different terms for it, but I read through sort of what each of them are saying about what does congregational vitality mean, and there, there was one theme that was across all of them, and I, I call it the, the missional mark of congregational vitality. It's about mission. It's about outward service, right? And so the ELCA defines that as um, positive impact on the wider community. The UMC calls it engaged disciples and mission and outreach. The UCC calls it connection to the world, social outreach and evangelism. The Episcopal Church calls it risk-taking mission and service. And then we, the PCUSA, call it outward incarnational focus. What is of incarnation? Course, of course we, we use incarnational. <laughs> <laughs> of course we, yes. uh -huh. Incarnation, which is uh, Latin word carne, is meat or flesh. Incarnation is this idea, it's what we talk about with Jesus. Jesus mm -hmm. became flesh and dwelt among us, that is the incarnation. And what the PCUSA says about outward incarnational focus, <clears throat> uh, they, they make a distinction between outward incarnational focus versus inward institutional survival. And this is, this, this is words from there. Beyond relationship with those of similar existence, the incarnate Christ dwells among the lowly and the least, the stranger and the suffering, the marginalized and majority. And it's a missional focus on where Christ is already living and present and where Christ is calling us to dwell as followers of Christ. So that's how we Presbyterians define this, what I'll call the missional mark of congregational vitality. And I think that is where I see our success as a church, is the fact that this church has consistently, through the years, embraced this, what, what we're now calling an outward incarnational focus, right? We are choosing to be out in the community, to be flesh, to enflesh God's love in the community and in what we do. That, that's my take as I read through all of these congregational vitalities. Um, so, why do I think that? We can talk about our church for a moment, right? We're a city of 25,000, home of Hastings College, of course. The population in Hastings has not moved in four decades, maybe five decades, I think, at this point. That is remarkable, right? So towns in Nebraska are either growing or shrinking, right? And most rural towns are shrinking, and most urban towns and towns on the freeways are growing. So we're rural, we're not on the freeway, we're not shrinking, but we're also not growing. What does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> But we're geographically isolated, right? It's 25, 30 miles to Grand Island, 45 miles to Kearney, and 90 miles to Lincoln. So it's not like we don't have suburbs that we're drawing from, <laughs> right? Because a lot of churches, when they talk about how to grow in congregational vitality, it's like you, you pull in from the suburbs. We, I mean, we've pulled in from Minden. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> but, Julieta. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Kennesaw. Uh -huh. Except Kennesaw has their own church, so we wouldn't want to. Okay. Yeah. What's that? Donovan? Donovan, maybe? They've got a Methodist Catholic church up there. A Methodist church, too. Methodist, okay. So, so here we are. We're First Presbyterian Church of Hastings. You know, next year we celebrate our 150th anniversary. We also prioritized founding a college at our own risk as a church. Um, we put our own sort of money on the line to found the college back in 1882, 140 years ago, um, because we thought it was important enough that the town of Hastings had a college, a Presbyterian college. Um, but we have, this church, in my opinion, has always had a strong historic focus on mission. This is not something that I brought with me. <laughs> this is something you all have been doing from the start of your church, starting with founding the college, which was a form of mission. Um, and then for those of you who attended the Living History event, I'm, I'm gonna lose the name of the female professor Catherine, that was played by Carpenter. Laura Carpenter. Carpenter. Yeah. It's not Catherine, it's uh, 
Carpenter was the last name. I'll think of it in a second. Janet? No. Janet Carpenter. Janet Carpenter. Good. Um, her house was, Her house is uh -huh. like a half block, I mean, two her houses from the Her story, though, yeah. is revolutionary, <laughs> right? Yeah. A woman who attended Hastings College, mm -hmm. went on to get a master's and a doctorate, and come back here and, and be a full professor in the early 1900s? Where you could have found colleges on the East Coast that didn't have any female faculty. Yeah. Right? So, um, one example of this, uh, you know, of course, founded in 1873, but in, in 1915, this is the story that Bill Nottage Tacey has told me, and um, I haven't asked Laura to look in the archives for this, but I, I find this really interesting. So, the church was supporting a missionary in Armenia. And uh, the Turks came into Armenia and were committing genocide. And our missionary wrote a letter back to our church, which made it into our pastor's hands, uh, about the genocide that was occurring in Armenia in 1915 by the Turks. And apparently he got on a train, rode to Washington, D.C., and presented the letter to the Department of State to try to get them to intervene on the genocide that was occurring in Armenia. And this church supported the missionary and supported their pastor taking his time to go all the way to D.C. by train to hand deliver this letter to the State Department in order to try to stop the massacre that was occurring in Armenia. That speaks volumes about the missional heart of this church. Right? Um, then, of course, we have Dr. Cy Kessler and his wife, Ruth. Uh, Dr. Kessler was the pastor here from 1940 to 1976, and he continued this tradition of a focus on mission and service, uh, both to the community and to uh, the larger church. He really prioritized serving the larger church as well, recognizing the value of that. Um, Dr. Kessler served on a number of boards in town, and that's a big deal because that's this church choosing to give up their senior pastor's time for working inside the walls of the church to work outside the walls of the church. That's a big deal. This church is saying it's as important for us that our pastor is out serving the community as it is that he's sitting in his office or writing a sermon or doing hospital visits or whatever. We, we want to balance that, and, and Dr. Kessler did. And he founded, helped found a number and served on a number of uh, nonprofit boards throughout his tenure as the senior pastor here. Um, that's a big deal. And then uh, Go and Serve, which of course started during Sai's tenure as the pastor here. And you all, uh, this is part of your church. This is normal for you, but this is not normal. Um, this short-term mission trips really didn't start in other churches until the mid to late 90s. That's when other churches started running short-term mission trips. This church has been doing it since 1966. And it's part of this church's identity. You have a whole wall in the fellowship hall devoted to celebrating this. And each year you all gather resources for this and support our youth and send youth and adults on these mission trips year after year after year after year. Again, this is that missional focus that I, I think is that mark of congregational vitality that, that perhaps tells the story for why we are bucking all those national trends. Um, what else? First Presbyterian Church uh, established the first Habitat for Humanity chapter in central Nebraska in 1992. Um, I believe, and people can correct me here, we started the Hastings Food Pantry here at First Pres. Eventually it became a ministry of multiple churches now it's currently housed, uh, the distribution point is currently housed at First St. Paul's, but the storage and sorting facility is right over here in the Peace Center. But that was a, initially a mission project started here at First Presbyterian Church. Um, of course, we talk about the, the open table sack lunch program that we do with Catholic Social Services. We collaborate with other churches to do good work in the community. And so then I got here in 2017, and I was blessed to inherit this very rich legacy of mission. 
Um, and it is part of what drew me to this church. And it's part of the reason that I accepted the call to serve this church. Uh, it was important to me. And so what did I do my first year? I spent a year uh, listening, assessing, trying to learn, and doing a lot of cheerleading. Y'all were a little bit down on yourselves when I got here. <laughs> and, uh, and there needed to be a little bit of uh, building up and, and cheerleading that needed to happen. And then uh, my second year here, we started uh, uh, the strategic planning process. And the, the questions that we asked, uh, and Brady Rhodes helped us with this. When have you experienced First Pressure and Church of Hastings at its very best? What was going on? What did that look like? What did that feel like? And we collected these stories, and then um, I continued this work of listening, assessing, learning, and cheerleading, and storytelling, getting you all to tell your own story. But in answer to this question, when have you experienced First Pressure and Church of Hastings at its very best? What was going on? What did that look and feel like? A lot of the answers to that question were about our church's missional engagement, which again points me to think that part of the reason this congregation is thriving is that missional identity marker. And so then we landed on a new mission statement, which reflects that, right? Welcoming all, that's a form of mission in and of itself, welcome and hospitality, and being intentional and saying that we're going to welcome everyone who comes through our doors. Living the love of God and neighbor, again, living not just speaking the love of God and neighbor, it's actively living the love of God and neighbor. And then seeking to transform ourselves, our community, outward focus, and our world to be more Christ-like through service, worship, fellowship, education, and prayer. Um, and service got moved to the front of the line when we rewrote that mission statement. So once we all agreed on this, we started using it to assess the existing ministries and develop new ministries. And we also made it the focus of the church as much as possible uh, through our preaching, through our community structure, through our work, our projects, and our programs. And the result of that has been really good, right? Um, it's led to growth. It's led to vitality. It's led to health. Um, one key mission program that I think all of you, at one point or another, have participated in is our United Harvest Mobile Food Pantry. But this is a phenomenal ministry because it's an easy way for people to engage and to be the hands and feet of Christ in a tangible way to serve the needs of our neighbors. COVID has disrupted part of this, which is the relational part. And I lament that. And I hope there's a day when we can go back to doing the relational part of this ministry, which is actually interacting with people besides just through a car window, uh, but actually being able to interact with them. Um, you know, Prior to COVID, sometimes people would ask me, well, why do we have cart pullers? People can certainly pull their own carts uh, and collect their food and load it in their car. But it's, it's, it's about the, the relationship, right? So the cart puller is engaging. You're looking the person in the eyes. You're smiling at them. You're hopefully bringing dignity to this process. Um, and so that's, that's a program that I think exemplifies that missional identity and missional focus that I was talking about. Um, also, our partnerships, we have a broader view. We, we don't limit our view just to Nebraska. And our partnership with uh, our mission co-worker, Mark Adams, and Frontera de Cristo, the border ministry that we participate in. And again, this is one that has laid a little bit fallow since COVID. We've still continued to engage with them and interact with them. We still buy their coffee. Uh, but I would like to see us get back into uh, um, this mutual mission. Because when I got here, uh, the year before I got here, we had sent a team down to Mexico. And the first year I was here, we brought visitors from Mexico up to here. And then the next year, we sent a team down to Mexico. And then the next year, we brought visitors from Mexico up to here. And that form of mutual mission where we're learning from each other, I think is really vital. And I think it brought a lot of life and health and vitality to our congregation. Um, and also put a human and theological face to what is these border issues, which are considered political issues. So this was uh, this was our last visit to Mexico, and this was our visit in 2019 when our mission coworkers and members of Frontera de Cristo came and visited us. And we uh, we met in the kitchen and cooked together, and then that was the basis of a meal that we served to the whole church, which was a lot of fun. So here's my conclusion, <laughs> and then we'll have 15 minutes to talk. But we've, we, I believe, we have sought to build our church's identity around mission, and that has led to 
the health and congregational vitality. I like to think, and I generally hear that we're known in Hastings as a church that cares for its community and the congregation that embraces and has pride in that identity. I know we have a little bit of a historical um, identity of, of being sort of the elite church uh, or not always that friendly, but I think I think we're overcoming that identity and this is this is what's taking that place. And then, like I said, we've added 120 new members in five years and we keep running this surplus budget, which is great. Uh, again, these are the tangible metrics that we can look at to tell us whether or not we're healthy as a church. So, the once and future church, let's dream together. What do y'all think? I'm gonna stop sharing my slideshow so that the camera starts picking us up instead of just in a little tiny box. And uh, I have to ask, what was the church in the graphic? Uh, one that I found online. Looks <laughs> <laughs> like a nice welcoming church. Yeah. So I think if I leave the slides, or if I leave, it's just going to be, hopefully it'll keep recording on there, right? Um, I'll watch for it. <laughs> okay. So if I leave the meeting, the meeting still stays open, right? Yep. Okay. The owl is still working here, right? Good. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Well, then I can now put the slide back up. And, and it's still recording, so we're good. Let's dream together. Hi, Dwight. Hi. You got here just in time for us to dream together. <laughs> I'll share a little anecdote. It's, it's just a short one. Um, we're talking about going to different places and, and recognizing different communities of people. Um, one of the things that happened in the morning at United Harvest was that we, we get occasionally some young people who come in and doing court appointed um, work for us because they needed to. And um, one morning, a, a mom came in to pick up um, her teenager, and, and she said, you know, he, he's, he wants to keep coming back here because he finds that this is the place he wants to be. Mm. Whoa. Yeah. That's very good. <clears throat> I have really appreciated uh, that ministry for a variety of reasons. Um, but one of them is, is, yeah, it draws in other community members to help serve. In addition to the recipients, there's also the volunteer aspect. And um, we've been able to engage. And, and frankly, we've had a number of families join the church who first came to know about our church by serving at United Harvest. Um, they, they saw a church that was authentically engaged in serving its community. They got invited by other people. They came and served a few times. And eventually, that led to them attending church. That's not the reason we do that ministry. But it's a really wonderful side effect of that ministry. Well, and just one little thing is that it was a way to say something to a teenager who didn't have apparently a lot of other options for, right. for sharing their talents or getting to know other people. So it's, I'm not sure the family would have come to any church. I, we didn't get into that conversation at the time. But that's an interesting group of people, and, and college students are the same thing. What's happening? that's outside of what I do in school or in sports or in whatever every day that's happening in our community that matters. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's an interesting group as they grow to find a meaning. Right. So th this is if we if we get, go back to what, where I started all those depressing slides. <laughs> um and we I, I talked about membership. There's a there's sort of this thing on, on uh, the generational theory. So part of the reason that this trend line stayed so high following World War II, uh, what sociologists have said is that um, people said we never want to happen again what happened in Germany with Hitler. And one of the places they thought that they could avoid that from happening was by being actively engaged in the church. They thought the church could be a force for good to avoid anything like that ever happening in this country. So um, when you talk to, when sociologists have interviewed what they call the silent generation, which is the generation before boomers and the boomers, but particularly the silent generation, part of the reason church membership stayed, stayed so steady through the 50s and 60s uh, was that the silent generation was committed to make sure that that could not happen again in this world. And they thought, 
participating in the church would be one of the ways that would keep that from happening. We know historically that the church was complicit in some of what happened in Germany, but we won't get into that <laughs> in detail. That was that was the American thought and perspective on that. So mm -hmm. the silent generation was committed. Um, and the boomers were committed because their parents raised them in the church, right? 40s, 50s, 60s, these kids were raised in the church and it was sort of understood. And what they said about church engagement at that time was you were born into it, which particularly if we look at this slide, right, up in the 90s, you were born into it. So you're born and then you come to believe by going through confirmation and by sitting in church and learning the creeds and all that stuff. And then that changes your behavior. So the, the, the cycle, the sociological cycle is born or um, yeah, born, believe, behave. Born and also belong, right? So you're, you're born in the church, right? You belong there because that's, you know, and, and even now when we do infant baptism, like kids are belonging, right? So belong, believe, behave. What they're saying for Matt's generation in particular, but even for my generation, is that that is not the case anymore, right? Kids are not born into belonging to the church necessarily, or if they are, as soon as they hit college, they're out, right? Matt didn't leave the church in college, did he? I didn't go here, though. Okay. I, I did. I was super active in my church through high school, and I went to college, and I stopped going to church for part of college. That changed eventually, but... Um, so, so the, the belong piece is no longer there. And what uh, millennials and Gen Xers say is we want to see real authentic, authenticity, real behavior change. So, so for them, it starts with the behave, right? Are, is the church really serving its community? Is it really doing what it says it's about? And do I want to be part of that? And that's why United Harvest is such a great opportunity for teenagers and college students, right? That's the behave. All of a sudden they see the church authentically doing what it says it's about. That leads to belief. Oh, why is the church doing this? I'd like to learn more. I'm going to show up on Sunday and try to learn. So behave, believe, and then maybe belong. But we talked about membership earlier, right? And this, these generations don't join organizations. So the whole cycle is right from belong, believe, behave, to behave, believe, belong, right? And so the whole cycle has reversed itself. And so I, I think if churches are not authentically behaving in ways that are consistent with what we're saying, then most Gen Xers and millennials have excuse me, have a very high BS meter, right? <laughs> they can sniff out inauthentic behavior that quick. They don't trust institutions to begin with. And they can sniff out inauthentic behavior. And so if we're not behaving and they can't participate in that behavior, the belief will not follow, the belonging will never follow. Um, whereas the boomers, the, gen, the silent generation of boomers were born into it. They belonged before they were born or once they were born, and then they learned the belief system, and hopefully that led to behavior change. This is so the whole thing has been reversed. And so that's why I think churches that do provide authentic opportunities for service, where the church is being the church in the community and giving people a chance to really do a hands-on service and then connect that with the faith community, those are the ones that I think are experiencing more congregational vitality. The ones that are focused inward are the ones that are not, the ones that are declining, I think. I don't know, we've got about 10 more minutes. I totally agree with that. I was witness uh, to all that, being born into a very strong faith-based, authentic church and congregation, that as that generation passed on, it seemed to flip-flop a little bit, and they were still authentic, but not genuine. There just was something missing there, and over the, towards the last of the years, they became hand-ringers. 
And when we came to Hastings, people weren't wringing their hands. Their hands were open in welcome and in welcome to all. And that's one problem. When you're a hand wringer, you're just focused on yourself. And there's a lot of that that, uh, frankly, I think they were at a loss. The leaders from the past were gone that basically ran everything uh, from the pulpit to who's working in the kitchen and where you put the spoons and the forks. And, <laughs> and they were gone, and it was like, oh, the realization is that we got to take charge of this. And that true, genuine faith, I think it kind of left some of them. And they were just acting out. And that's where this is an authentic church. I truly believe in that. I and mean, the people here are the church. We say that every Sunday, and it's true. When we're at our best. Yes. When we're at our best. Mm -hmm. We were not always at our best. No. But, yeah. Um, I grew up in a church that I feel was more of a fear-based. Mm -hmm. Do the right thing or else. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I think it's kind of a child thing, you know. Mm -hmm. You tell the kids, these are... These are the consequences of your actions. And then all at once you grow up and then you go, okay, that fear-based, you know, I'm not afraid anymore. So then that takes you out of the church in, in, in theory, because that's what um, I'm getting out of it is that, you know, if I don't go to church, then I'm a bad person. If I don't do this, I'm a bad person. If I don't give this much of the truth, I'm a bad person. And so you and think that's contributing to this decline? Almost definitely. That fear basis. Almost fear definitely. Basis. Yeah. What's interesting, though, is it's a lot easier to manipulate people and get people yes. to do what you want with fear yes. than it is with hope and love. Yes. Right? It's easier to te teach fear than faith. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and that's, that's I think, what was missing. I don't know. You know, you know I, I grew up in a small town, Sutton. And still in that town, if you go to the Reformed Church, you do not work on Sunday. It doesn't matter if you're a farmer, whatever, you do not work. And, um, and that was carried on, and it's still, still happening today. Every Reformed Church, basically, that's what they do. Right. And that is very the out, unknown in the rest of the world, basically. Right. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying that's what they were taught from... 100, 200 years ago, and that's what they still do. Yeah, and and like Sabbath keeping as a practice is important, and, and I'll talk about Sabbath keeping as a practice, but to do it rigidly and legalistically and say these are the only ways to do it, and then also you're going to go to hell if you don't, Yes. To, to me, like we need to view Sabbath keeping as a necessary part of our faith, not because we're afraid of going to hell, but because it can help us balance our lives in a very, very difficult world. Right. And that's and, and that's what you'll find, I think, with most of this church, both from our members and from our leadership and Pastor Damon and I, is we're not going to try to manipulate people out of fear. I'm not going to. My, my my theology professor in seminary called it fire insurance. She said, if you're if you're only going to church and professing a faith for fire insurance to keep yourself out of hell, that it's difficult for that to be an authentic faith. You've got to see the other side of it, which is the love and the hope piece, right? And if you can find the love and the hope piece, that will lead to a more authentic faith that will lead to authentic transformation in your life. Whereas simply operating out of fear is unlikely to, to, to really result in an authentic faith. Um, so that's... What else? I also believe that um, it then puts people in different categories. Right. If I'm doing this, then I'm better than you. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's something that um, happens all over. You know, if I do the right thing, then I'm better than you instead of we're all supposed to be equal. Yeah. You know, it puts that. You know, and then if you have a little community, then everybody, you know, then you have two sides. Right. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, the one of the two passages I'm preaching on talks about uh, God will enact righteousness and equity, and 
you're right. That that sort of fear-based us versus them is is not righteousness and equity, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I I have not. I, you need to talk to some of these sociologists that are studying these things because I think you're <laughs> onto something. <laughs> I'm I'm serious. Well, I experience in my own life. I can only share my own experience. Right, but I bet your experience is not alone. Well, I, I hope not. And I, I'm glad that you found a community that that um, that builds yeah. you up and doesn't just try to scare you. <laughs> <laughs> so. Can yeah. I have one final point here? Please. I do think this is a valuable conversation. And I think that we need to continue this conversation as we continue to think about and plan for the, the work of the church in Hastings over the course of the next five, 10 years. You know, we are fortunate in that we are bucking some of the national trend lines, but you continue to uh, to look at uh, our congregation uh, and uh, look out across the crowd. What does our uh, what does our church body look like in ten years? Yeah, no. And so, uh, so I do think it's uh, continually important for us to continue to uh, to look at what we can continue to do in our community to uh, to make an impact. Absolutely. Yeah. Anything else? There was a person in um, Sutton a long time ago that was definitely didn't go to church and didn't believe in God. And um, he passed away, basically went sleeping and didn't wake up. And he was like in his 50s and stuff like that. And somebody that didn't, well, I think it was, I mean, it doesn't matter the religion. But anyway, that person goes, why is it that that person died calmly? It's a really, really interesting insight. You know, yep. that individual should have suffered before it passed away on this earth. Yeah. You know, but that's when that's our belief. Yeah. And, and we're surrounded with and people with the same belief. Yeah. Then uh, that's the only thing that makes sense. But I was just like, I, there was nothing for me to respond to on that. I mean, it's just like, I'll leave that one alone. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to, yeah, wait. Uh, uh, do you have time? Uh, I, I need to go. We have new members that are joining the church here. Uh, I was just going to say that uh, my family had been uh, uh, unchurched for uh, years. My uh, father's father was a very strict congregationalist, and uh, and my dad was repelled by that, and so that I I I didn't even get baptized until I was a junior in high school, uh, and my mother was baptized with me at the same time because wow. her family was was unchurched, and uh, uh, and it was uh, Dean Weir called at our house uh, uh, from Hastings College, uh, <clears throat> called at our house and invited us to join the Presbyterian Church. And my uh, sisters were in college and, uh, and required to go to church. And so, so uh, it was the college's evangelical work, which, uh, 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 which brought our family into the church. And wow. It was, uh, um, and, and so I got baptized uh, when I had to walk up and kneel and be Dr. Kessler up, uh, get my head. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm going to close this in prayer. Y'all can continue this conversation if you'd like, but I, I, I've got to meet our new members in the library to, to get them ready for uh, membership. And we have a couple of session members that need to be there too. So let's uh, thank you again for joining me in this conversation. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God. We trust that the church is your church, God, and the church will sustain whatever comes its way. Uh, but we also ask you, God, to help us be a faithful branch of that church. Help us to strive to be the body of Christ in this time and place. Help us strive to be a source of love, light, hope, and faith in our community 
so that all may come to know your saving love and grace. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.